Good day. This is Paul Wax. I'm the executive director of the American College of Medical Toxicology. And I'd like to welcome you today to the medical and public health considerations of COVID-19. The topic for today will be poison centers and COVID-19, PPE in the addiction treatment settings and updates from the front lines, London and Newark. Next slide, please. Next slide. I'd like to thank our webinar series partners as seen on the screen. Next slide, please. This um, webinar is um, also being recorded and will be uh, up on our website at, in approximately 48 hours at acmg.net forward slash COVID-19 web. We are also uh, carrying this webinar by uh, live streaming on YouTube at the present time as well. Next slide. I'd like to thank our moderators today, including Dr. Ziad Kazi and Dr. Michael Lynch. Michael is the medical director of the Pittsburgh Poison Center and the board member of the American Association of Poison Control Centers. Next slide, please. Uh, we have no uh, conflicts of interest. Next slide. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Lynch, who will introduce the speakers for today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wax. Uh, very honored to be with you all today. Um, as we get ready to hear from uh, these distinguished speakers, we also wanted to uh, take a moment to share a resource uh, from our colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, they want us to let you all know that healthcare providers and health department staff with questions about COVID-19 can access the CDC COVID-19 Clinical Call Center 24 hours a day by calling 770-488-7100. The call center is staffed by trained clinicians who can assist with questions about CDC guidance for healthcare professionals, healthcare facilities, health departments, and laboratories. So today we're very fortunate to hear from uh, uh, several of my colleagues. Uh, first, we'll be hearing about personal protective equipment in addiction treatment settings and associated topics from Dr. Timothy Wigand. Uh, Tim is on the board of directors of the American Society of Addiction Medicine and director of toxicology and the toxicology consult service at the University of Rochester. Following that, we'll hear from uh, two medical directors from poison centers um, about the poison centers and COVID-19 response, including toxicological exposure trends and data and the public health response. We hear from Diane Colello. Uh, she is the medical and executive director of New Jersey Poison Information uh, and Education System, as well as Daniel Brooks. He's the medical director of the Poison and Drug Information Center and Outpatient Toxicology Clinic at uh, Banner University Medical Center in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Wigan. A brief presentation and it's limited to a few key points and uh, I wanted to really stress the patients with substance use disorders and addiction and the infrastructure are particularly at risk and vulnerable with this pandemic. Um, going back to early March it was like a storm on the horizon as we went from basic precautions uh, limiting group size, uh, limiting the number increasing the number of prescriptions, keeping patients with comorbidities 
away from the, the public and the, the specific sites to dramatically different ways of practice, uh, changes to care delivery with telehealth, regulation, use of the sites, bed availability, financial uh, implications and reimbursements and concerns quickly arose. There was some early warning signs from Washington State, if we remember the outbreak in Washington. Um, I received an email from the director of an opiate treatment program and he highlighted particular uh, uh, vulnerabilities. He noted that 35% of patients in one of his facilities, one of the opiate treatment programs, were homeless. They had high rates of comorbidities, COPD, heart disease, diabetes. Uh, they, they had frequent movement throughout the community, um, hospitals, detox, jails, medical clinics, social services, Many had housing issues, homeless group gathering sites were in issues. They identified congestion at single sites, including opiate treatment programs where the medications were dispensed, where drug screens were collected. Uh, there were factors involving social distancing, quarantine, PPE availability and use, as well as systems adjustments that clearly needed difference. And very quickly changes need, need, were needed to CFR 42 regulations, the DEA regulations regarding medication dispensement, and federal, uh, federal regulations, as well as guidance and clarity regarding telehealth in order for this uh, the infrastructure to respond to the pandemic. In early March, there were lots of questions but limited guidance. There are questions about testing for COVID, where to do it, how long would tests uh, take to come back, where, uh, what to do in the meantime. Uh, were staff essential or non-essential when programs were told to uh, close their doors and uh, only keep essential staff on site for addiction treatment? Um, where to quarantine um, if a positive uh, was identified, if there was an inpatient or in a residential setting, um, if they had a, a home to go to, who was at home, were there vulnerability at home with patients or parents? Um, if they were homeless, was there a shelter available? Many of the shelters in our area limited admissions or had issues of their own. And screening, how should it be done at the detox, at the inpatient settings? Uh, in terms of asymptomatic patients, as well as staff, and most importantly, PPE. The hospitals had limitations, the EDs had limits in what they had available, masks, um, uh, protective equipment. Uh, all of the facilities had questions on how do we get enough, who should have PPE, when should we apply it, and in certain situations, how do we train staff, and for example, the N95, the PAPR, and other uh, types of PPE. Uh, there were state and national and regional programs that started to get involved and were communicating better, medical director involvement from around the state and um, were coordinating care. Uh, an example uh, protocol from a detox or an inpatient setting that illustrates a flowchart, but you can see there's many different uh, weak points um, and on this flowchart where you had uh, issues and limitations, apply mask, well, what if we didn't have a mask, isolate the appropriate room but we don't have negative pressure rooms in order for, to isolate. Uh, call the hotline to triage. Well, the hotline has a uh, delay in response and we've got a busy signal for the last hour. Um, if we need to quarantine, um, which staff uh, are appropriately trained to uh, deliver meds, to deliver food? Uh, when we have community bathrooms, how does that apply to the uh, quarantine? So obviously despite protocols, there were a lot of issues Addiction treatment care happens in many sites, in the hospitals, in the outpatient clinics, in the inpatient setting, uh, detoxes, residential programs, primary care, and the emergency department, and inpatient consult services. The site guidance started to become available, but there were considerations depending on which site uh, the, the, the patient was at. The principles involved protecting the patients and their staff from COVID-19 infection, maintaining access to addiction treatment services, so that care was not interrupted and to maintain a therapeutic environment for patients with substance use disorder treatment. You imagine being at a detox and quarantined to a single room for seven days while undergoing an alcohol or a benzodiazepine or an opiate detox. It's challenging enough with the support and resources and communal rooms and things within a quarantine to a specific room has unique considerations. The considerations were the acuity of the treatment needs, bed availability, medical risk of COVID-19 infection. What about the risk of spread to others in the facility? And the context, the federal, state, local regulations and directions and resource limitations in particular related to PPE. You can see the image of two of my colleagues that um, are wearing homemade masks um, from my parents who learned very quickly of the limitations and the uh, lack of PPE that we had in many sites and quickly uh, 
followed guidelines and knitted appropriate masks, mostly to, for the spread, uh, to prevent the spread of um, COVID um, if, a patient, if a person or patient staff were positive, but um, to also wear in the community. And I, you can see the, the highlight from the protocol, apply masks, um, and many things as applying the homemade mask. Um, the site, the, the resources from federal and uh, national uh, programs were, were quickly coming out. This is a, a ASAM site, American Society of Addiction Medicine has done an excellent job um, in providing guidance and um, information about uh, uh, multiple different issues that affect the state and, and local uh, treatment programs. Uh, ASAM, as well as many other, of the other professional uh, groups developed task force uh, for taking care of patients and responding to the community, as well as providing advocacy for um, patient and uh, program uh, support in this time. The ASAM uh, COVID task force is a CPDC caring for patients during COVID-19 and uh, some of my colleagues on ACMT as well as ASAM are involved in this um, task force. Uh, no matter what the guidance, there are still issues. One of the clear successful strategies from other countries early on was that isolation was key. When you had a positive individual, removing them from other non-positive individuals regarding COVID was important. And despite early proposals of creating the dormitories or hotels or uh, wherever we had availability to quarantine positive individuals that they couldn't do so at home, there was resistance mostly because of the logistic support. Who is gonna pay for this? Um, who would uh, assume liability? And um, still, uh, despite having some success in our area and other areas around the country, there are issues that arise. Our detox inpatient residents are not well equipped to quarantine patients. And um, this is a, a slide from a Pennsylvania drug treatment centers pose risk, but many have nowhere to go. So if we quarantine them, and um, you don't have a safe place to send them uh, home to that um, can support the patients, and there's not a hotel or a dormitory that can support them, um, you run the risk of simply spreading among the staff and patients at the facility. Uh, I've identified some opportunities and challenges at, as of April 15th with regard to COVID-19. I've seen some phenomenal success at broader access to patients and novel support mechanisms for example, the phone and telehealth administration and support, internet support with AA, NA, and Heroin Anonymous. Uh, patients really like this and has created broader access and availability to these programs. Patients that had transportation limitations. Ambulatory detox is expanding. Networks of communication are developing. I've had more patients quit smoking in the last uh, couple of weeks as they worried about the effects of COVID on, on their lungs if they continue to smoke. And we have novel ways of delivering addiction care through applications on the computer and a smartphone. Opportunities for poison controls to provide model support and novel support and monitoring and triage exist. There's potential to assist with ambulatory detox, uh, poisoning prevention, med safety counseling in particular as increases in dosing with methadone and buprenorphine and other medications uh, that are ending up in the home are occurring and to assist with linking patients from the ED and the hospital. Uh, vulnerabilities include more medications available in precarious settings with children, methadone take homes, for example have dramatically increased in unstable patients in order to decongest the clinic. More associated and adjunctive medications are available. And there's increased staff stress with patients and with staff, less monitoring, minimal drug screens. The most vulnerable, the highest risk, the most complicated are uh, at risk during this uh, pandemic. There's limited bed availability in some settings in the inpatient and detoxification centers where they have uh, double units now converted to single beds and shelter bed space is limited. We're seeing more complicated emergency department hospital overdoses with methadone, for example, in some settings or unintentional ingestions. Mental health decompensation is occurring as well, and there's increasing alcohol use and dependence. Uh, this is my last slide. I wanna uh, remind the attendees that this coming Friday, ACMT and ASAM will be jointly sponsoring a webinar um, looking at the treatment of substance use disorder and addiction during the time of COVID using a case-based approach and love experts from ACMT as well as ASAM supporting this event. And that's this coming Friday, April 17th at 1 p.m. And you have my contact information if any questions. Thank you, please reach, reach out with any questions or, or information.
Um, thanks very much, Tim. We'll jump right in, I think, to the uh, Poison Center part of this. I just want to thank ACMT and APCC and all of the AC, ACTLB organizations involved for letting us tell this, our part of the story and how Poison Centers became involved and I believe have become an integral part of the COVID-19 response. Um, several Poison Centers have become involved from January on. I, will, I think I speak for Dr. Brooks and myself when I say this has occupied many of our waking hours and a lot of our sleepless hours trying to get our Poison Centers kind of ramped up from being Poison Centers to being um, pandemic response lines. Um, and the question I often get is, why? You know, why are poison centers the COVID hotlines? And the answer in New Jersey, I think, is very, was very simple and I think has been the case nationally, which is in many states, poison centers are the ready to go 24 seven hotline that's already staffed with healthcare professionals. And it's a known entity and a trusted entity for the public and for healthcare professionals. So it's, it's kind of a natural choice even though it's not actual toxicology. In New Jersey, we have experience with a lot of other urgent hotlines, including the response to the Zika virus, H1N1 and flu on call and others. I know that's the case in Arizona and nationally. Um, in addition to the capacity to answer calls over and over and over and many hundreds of calls a day as a call center, we also have the ability to provide real-time feedback to stakeholders and decision makers. What kinds of questions are people asking? What is the need out there? What do people need to know? And what do we think might be working that isn't? Um, poison centers have made different choices about the numbers they've used, uh, whether it is the national hotline or other dedicated lines, as I'll talk about in a minute. And a lot of centers, including ours, have part partnered with other disaster response hotlines like 211. 211 in New Jersey has become a vital part of the COVID response as a non-medical hotline for other COVID related concerns from the public, including where to obtain supplies and testing sites. This is a map of states where poison centers have joined the COVID-19 response. Next slide. And how it evolved in New Jersey basically was back in January when we realized there was gonna be a need for a response we offered our services to the New Jersey Department of Health, and I believe they were very glad for us to do that. Initially, the intent was as a public information line, but it became clear that everyone was gonna call, including healthcare professionals, municipalities, school administrators, anybody who needed information about this kind of constantly changing pandemic that we faced. In contrast to other hotlines, we did not operate with a formal script but basically just a dedicated daily effort to read the New Jersey Department of Health and the CDC talking points and other information as it came out. We have now, I think we consume a tremendous amount of information every day. We decided initially to use the 800-222 national hotline. Um, and we did that because it's easy to remember, it's easily recognized, and we really wanted poison control centers to be recognized as part of the COVID-19 response. Um, but we ended up changing that practice because this is a national hotline that routes based on wherever you're calling from. And um, that resulted at times in spillover into neighboring poison centers as our call volume surged. We found that to be more and more of a case. We were getting calls from New York, our partners in New York, and. Pennsylvania saying we're getting New Jersey calls and a lot of them. So we ended up transitioning to a dedicated line that you see here, which rings only in New Jersey. And that um, has been a positive change. And the questions that have come in through the hotline have changed as has the shape of the pandemic here in New Jersey. So initially it was, what are the symptoms? How can I get tested? Um, I heard there was a case in New Jersey, what do we do? And now it has evolved to more serious concerns like I have a fever and a cough and I'm having some trouble breathing, what should I do? Or I believe I'm sick, but my doctor's office is not able to see me, um, what should I do? Should I go to the ER? Uh, should I, how do I safely isolate from a sick family member? This is an example of a lot of the messaging that's gone out with our partners in the upper left-hand corner is the press release that originally went out from the New Jersey Department of Health. 
You can see in the middle is a press conference that we held with our U.S. Senator uh, Menendez announcing our service available to the New Jersey public. And then in the right-hand corner, you can see all of the different now contact methods that we have in New Jersey as the demand increased. So we have 211, we have our hotline, we also have through 211 a text service and an interactive website, covid19.nj.gov, which we collaborate on. Next slide. So this is the state, the status of New Jersey. As you can see, we are right at ground zero, uh, New York and New Jersey with many, many cases, many deaths. Um, and on the right hand side is our real time GIS map that sits on the wall of our poison center. You can see the density of our calls mirrors that of the counties in New Jersey, hardest hit Bergen, Hudson and Essex where we currently are located at the Poison Center. And the number I have circled is our call volume. So you can see, if you can, that that says 581 calls. Our daily average as a Poison Center was about 150 to 160. And this number is about where we are every day now. We're taking between five and 600 calls. And in the height of our surge before 211 came on in March, we hit a thousand calls. So this has changed the poison center in countless ways, as you might imagine. Next slide. So initially we started by just having everybody work more hours and harder. Uh, that was our you know, immediate response to opening the phone lines. We realized that was a short term response, but our spies have worked tremendously hard, both extra hours and extra calls. Um, Bruce and uh, uh, Ruck, Dr. Bruce Ruff, our managing director, and I have also taken countless calls ourselves. Um, but clearly, we needed more personnel, and we recruited volunteers from within our Rutgers uh, large institution and Rutgers Behavioral Health Sciences, as well as the Office of Emergency Medicine, I'm sorry, Emergency Management Services in the state and other volunteer organizations. Um, the volunteers and the temporary workers on our site, to be clear, do not answer poisoning calls. They're deployed specifically for COVID-19 calls and for the predominantly shallow interactions that just require information. They have the capacity to escalate if anybody needs actual medical advice to aspire to management. And we routinely use that capacity. Uh, we practice aggressive social distancing our cubicles are well over six feet apart. We sanitize all workstations. Nobody shares a headset. And we encourage everybody, of course, to stay home <clears throat> if there's any risk of uh, transmission. After recruiting volunteers, we took our exclusively on-site workforce of spies to potential for remote teleworker status. So all of our spies are now transitioning to be able to work remotely in the event of quarantine or just to kind of ease the burden of commuting in extra hours. And then um, we brought 211 on board and we have enhanced our workflow to prioritize poisoned calls. So about a month ago, we realized that if the COVID-19 volume was truly overwhelming, it would squeeze out poisoning calls and prevent us from carrying out our primary mission, which is to provide poisoning assistance. So if you go to the next slide, Dan, I'll demonstrate how we get those calls through. And this is the Poisoning Take Priority Initiative. So on the left, you can see if you call, you get thank you for calling New Jersey Poison. That's in English or Spanish. If uh, you're then given the option, if this is a poisoning emergency, press two, and that rings all the phones in the center. If it's a call about poisoning, but not an emergency, it goes to a priority queue. And if it's a call about COVID, uh, the caller is given a choice for general questions to dial 211 or to stay on the line and get into the COVID queue. And my last slide is just a demonstration of how our volumes have been since we started on January 27th. You can see that our COVID calls are the predominance of our calls. Um, and our poisoning calls did experience a bit of ebb, which we don't know if it's because of poisoning incidents dropping um, or just overwhelming volume of calls. But calls have recovered and this is the website I mentioned where we are feeding our call information into an interactive site. So the public doesn't necessarily have to call, but can get information by going to this website. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Brooks, who can talk about the Arizona experience. 
Thanks, Diane. The Arizona Poison System enjoys a strong alliance with our public health partners. And about eight years ago in 2012, we set up the Center for Toxicology and Pharmacology Education and Research, or CITBER, at the University of Arizona College of Medicine, Phoenix. And that includes the leaders and staff of both Arizona Poison Centers, our partners down in Tucson and up here in Phoenix. And we've established partnerships with all the state and county departments of health services, the governor's office, as well as offices of the medical examiner. And our staff uh, have either chaired or members of fatality review committees, as well as emergency preparedness groups. And it, it's been a really strong and nimble relationship where we can make decisions and act on things within hours or days at most. And here's an example. So March 20th, we started to realize that we were getting a lot of local calls about inappropriate use of household products or questions about using household products to treat COVID or prevent it. And we also noticed that some providers unfortunately were giving out prescriptions for medications to non-hospitalized patients. So we reached out to Maricopa County uh, Public Health and just said, hey, we we're worried about this. Do you support us in, in having a press release? And about four hours later, we had a press release out we, we had some nibbles and some interest on Friday and a little bit more on Saturday morning. But unfortunately, less than 36 hours later, and this was Sunday afternoon, we had a married couple that used a aquarium product to try to prevent COVID. And unfortunately, the husband died, but the wife was resuscitated in the ED with the help of our staff and, and transferred to our service and, and, and recovered. And it, it was really uh, unfortunate, but it allowed the communication to move forward. And then the CDC had their health advisory up uh, uh, released in uh, that same week. From a timeline, we've had this relationship with our public health folks in the state for, for many years. So around January 6th, we actually contacted state and county health departments and said that we would be willing and able to stand up a COVID uh, call line. Uh, again, within, uh, within hours, we heard back from some of our partners and we started uh, taking calls a couple days later. We had a formal line that was set up with Maricopa County on the 26th. And then uh, throughout February and beginning of March, we uh, enrolled out to the other counties and the state throughout Arizona, initially using our 800 number like our partners in New Jersey did, but then deciding that we should have a unique number for it. So on March uh, 11th of this year, we had a statewide uh, number went out. And this COVID hotline is staffed by both uh, uh, poison centers where the calls are geo-routed based on the caller's location. We use an automated integrated uh, voice response or IVR triage system. And as of yesterday, around eight or 9 a.m., we've had almost 56,000 calls through the IVR. And that's resulted in almost 16,000 uh, calls being pushed forward to our Poison Center staff, that person-to-person uh, -person communication, and they've all generated uh, cases uh, for the National Poison Data System. In Arizona, about 10% of these calls come from providers and our average uh, call time is about seven minutes. We have scripted information that we rely on our public health partners to, to uh, provide to us. We give them feedback and we update them on a routine basis. This is an older version from a couple weeks ago. And we share all of this information for all of our staff, about 85% of whom are working remotely for safety reasons. And we, we share this all in a SharePoint that's open to uh, everyone with access to the poison. We have an internet presence as well. The ADHS website and county websites are, are very prominent and push out information uh, on a daily basis. And for the state, you can track things based on county as far as number of cases and deaths, as well as uh, testing results um, are quantitated again on a daily basis. And then we use our, our, our uh, electronic medical record system as well as our phone triage systems to run reports to look at productivity as well as time on the phone and abandonment rates and average call times. And we use this information to um, change how we're staffing and predicting how we need to um, prepare for increases or changes in the call volume. And one of the related activities we, we did with the College of Medicine Phoenix here was we established a uh, Poison Center COVID-19 educational rotation. So it's non-clinical, they're not at the bedside, but they are helping take care of folks both at home as well as providers that are caring for folks in hospitals throughout Arizona. And this was established for the residents, medical students in Arizona that had been removed for clinical rotations. This is both an educational and a service component. The education involves a COVID introductory lecture, which we update about every two or three days. We have a PCC orientation to our EMR as well as our process. 
and then the, all the rotators have access to our daily talks lectures that are ongoing for our fellows and, and residents um, that, that rotate with us. And, with, and then for service, we ask that our rotators spend two or three four hour shifts in the poison center, specifically on the COVID line. So I want to just spend uh, the last couple of minutes talking about some of the trends <clears throat> that we've seen in the national poison data system. So for those who don't know, the NPDS is the uh, database where all poison centers upload cases to on a real-time basis every eight minutes and provides a powerful national surveillance tool. So um, this is a representation of national poison call volume. Uh, both blue is poison calls or non-COVID-19 calls and yellow is the COVID-19. There have been, um, I think, over 200,000 calls to poison centers from COVID, uh, with respect to COVID-19. Um, and that number is maybe even higher, but the, you can see that the poison call volume has been preserved and poison calls have not leveled off nationally at all. Next slide. Interestingly, and not too surprisingly, we're starting to see increased exposures to things that people are using to keep themselves safe and in quarantine. And this data will be emerging, I think, throughout the course of the year. But one of the trends that we've noticed is increased exposures to the hand sanitizers and the cleaners and disinfectants and um, byproducts of mixing bleach with other agents and et cetera. I personally have taken several calls from people who asked, you know, I, I wiped down my produce with a Lysol wipe and then I ate it, now what do I do? So we're seeing a lot of these mishaps. Next slide. So this um, is an NPDS bulletin, which depicts the uh, call volume for sodium hypochlorite or bleach cases. Um, and you can see that that is climbing. It has, we've seen a 48% increase from this year to last year. Uh, and if you look at the pie chart, uh, fortunately the predominance of these exposures have been minor, um, but we are definitely seeing an increase in them. Hand sanitizer similarly, have been predominantly minor effect, but some major and have seen a 32% increase. And lastly, the hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine anti-malarials, I know we're gonna speak about this in more detail in a future webinar on this series, but has also shown an increase with some major effects and death as Dr. Brooks mentioned. So uh, poison centers in conclusion, I think have provided a valuable component of the COVID-19 response not only being able to get information out to the public and healthcare professionals, but also to conduct ongoing and meaningful surveillance. So I thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Here's our uh, contact information and thanks to uh, Dr. Brooks for the collaboration. Thank you, Dr. Kalilo. This is uh, Ziad Kazi. Thank you again for tuning in today for this uh, webinar. I uh, just want to remind everyone that the slides will be available on our website for this presentation. This is being recorded and you will be able to access that probably by Friday, where we'll, uh, we'll post it there as well. And then regarding the um, uh, webinar that will be uh, uh, delivered uh, in collaboration between the American College of Medical Psychology as well as the uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine on Friday at 1 p.m., you will receive an invitation for that webinar and how to uh, register for it. Now, uh, we've completed the didactic portion of our webinar and we are going to move to our popular uh, section, which is titled Updates from the Frontline. Today, we are taking you uh, to New Jersey and London with Dr. Lewis Nelson, uh, who is the professor and chair of emergency medicine at Rutgers University. He's also a past president of the American College of Medical Toxicology. He will give us an update from Newark, followed by Dr. Paul Dargan, Professor of Clinical Toxicology, King's College, London, consultant, physician, and clinical toxicologist, guys in St. Thomas National Health Service Trust Foundation, London, UK. Dr. Nelson? Thank you, Ziad. Uh, I guess everybody figured out that Diane Kalel and I worked together in Newark, New Jersey. You saw the map before of Newark, and there's a, a nice map there. New Newark is the largest city in New Jersey. It's just outside of New York City. In fact, when I look out my window about eight miles away or 12 kilometers or so, I have a full view of the Empire State Building. 
Uh, so we really are right in the perimeter of the city of New York, which is, as many people know, is truly the epicenter of the uh, pandemic here in the United States. Uh, for better or worse, we've we've uh, taken a lot of the uh, overflow uh, or expansion of that of that pandemic ring into New Jersey, and much of it's hit in in the city of Newark. Again, it's the largest city. We're a public hospital. Uh, in a city that's largely got an urban population or a big level one trauma center. And um, we have a very busy emergency department. So despite having a very busy emergency department, our volume of conventional emergency department patients, meaning whatever you'd like that to mean, strokes, MIs, abdominal pain, seizures, has fallen about 60%. We've gone from about 250 visits a day down to about 100 a day. And we saw that occur as sort of the waters were receding as the tsunami was building. Uh, and then ultimately the tsunami did come, come in and our volume increased uh, only to about 60% of normal, but that additional 60, that additional 20% of patients were all respiratory and COVID patients. Uh, we now see around 77% of our patients in the main part of the emergency department uh, have respiratory illness. Uh, we uh, have a very large population that we screen out in a tent we built in the parking lot. And most of those patients are minimally or, 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 or moderately symptomatic. And believe it or not, we send them home. And as many people have talked about, sending home somebody with an oxygen saturation of 90 or 92% uh, is very uncomfortable for an emergency physician, but something that we're doing. And, and we have a nice follow-up system in place uh, we have the medical residents and some others calling these people as best we can and assuring that they're doing well. I wish we could have given them pulse oximeters to go home with, but we did not have the fourth or the resources to be able to do that. The place that did it does put a lot of comfort in our in our in our in our uh, care, knowing that our patients can come back when their pulse ox falls even further. Um, of the patients that wind up in the main emergency department, we have anywhere between a 75 and a 90 percent admission rate into the hospital. So clearly a very sick population makes their way back into the emergency department. And, and that's because we've been able to send home most of the patients who we've, who we've screened and, and, and been able to provide follow-up for. <clears throat> As you could imagine, it turns out that our hospital is not big enough to fill all of our admitted patients. So the emergency department, like most emergency departments, becomes a holding area for uh, such patients. And in fact, we have more patients holding in the emergency department on any given day than we have beds in the emergency department. So if you could imagine what a chaotic scene it looks like when there are double and even triple stretchers lined up against the nurse's station or the wall with patients who in, under normal conditions would be uh, even perhaps admitted to a step down unit or an ICU bed. It is really quite the scene and very stressful for everybody. Um, we have not had any problems with PPE or some protective equipment. We've, we've, we've used uh, N95s in the emergency department and have had no problem obtaining those. And that's not true for many other places where they have run out. Uh, we have not had any problem with ventilators either. So we've been able to intubate and ventilate as needed. Uh, there is this continuous concern, of course, about the aerosolization and exposure, given that we have curtained rooms, not uh, walled rooms. So our ventilated patients are sitting in a space that we share the air with at the nurse's station with no negative pressure capabilities. Um, overall, the, the um, morale has been quite good and people come to work and, and the collegiality is built. I think it's like many stressful times, it builds tight relationships with people, uh, not to say that all things are great. And as everybody experiences, there's stress beyond what anybody would normally um, have to endure in, in a modern day medical establishment. When you walk into the emergency department, it's a sea of green and blue. Everybody's wearing PPE, including headgear, uh, face masks and scrubs. Uh, many are even wearing uh, booties and things like that. Although that's not, it's not what we normally uh, ask people to, um, to wear. Um, there are a few uh, areas that for those that have dealt with the disease you'd appreciate, which is just the fascination of how these patients present. 
Uh, you see people with oxygen saturations that you wouldn't even think support life, 40%, 50%, who are walking and talking. And what's even more impressive is how three, four, 10, 12 hours later, they just crash and they wind up intubated. We've pushed like many people to reduce the rate of intubation, or at least we've raised the threshold to intubate our patients because we've recognized that many of them, the longer we can delay intubation, the better at the outcome appears to be in that population. Um, we, um, we work, we're working strongly on getting better testing. That's a bit of a state problem. It's a bit of a national problem, uh, but we just don't have adequate testing, which would be much easier. It would allow us to move patients through more quickly, but it's something that as, as uh, we get more testing approved and, and able to be, to be obtained, we're gonna do obviously better. It would be great to really understand better the aerosolization risk. I think we're practicing in an, in an area where we're um, either exposing people unnecessarily or we're overutilizing over PPE for a fear we just don't understand. And I think better understanding that would be wonderful. And I think what we're really hoping to find out, and many on the call are as well, is just what does immunity look like once people have experienced the disease? I mean, clearly a vaccine is a while off. We've had a number of, of residents, staff, faculty, uh, and nurses get sick and others come back to work now. And the question of course is, do they still need to be concerned about contracting the disease again? And what is their PP requirement going to be? But it has been really one very impressive disease. I will say that um, if you haven't yet seen your surge, be prepared. Uh, it is uh, a daunting experience, but one that I think uh, will leave a lasting impression, probably positive on hindsight in most of us. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Um, appreciate your uh, your comments and the update. We will uh, we have several questions for you, but we're gonna we are going to address all questions for the entire webinar at the end. Stay tuned and remember to type them in. Uh, moving on to Dr. Paul Dargan from London. Dr. Dargan. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you speak up just a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Hello. Um, thanks very much, Ziad, and everybody at ACMT uh, for putting this uh, webinar series together. It's been great to connect and share with friends and colleagues at this testing time. I'm going to present an update from the UK with a, a focus on London, specifically St. Thomas's Hospital, which is where I'm based in central London. Uh, to, next slide, please. Um, so we, we just in briefly to introduce the timeline, COVID has been an issue in the UK since the end of January with the first domestic cases in late February. Um, travel restrictions put in place in late February, early March, and when we were starting to see a handful of cases throughout the UK and particularly London, but it was mid-March before we started to see significant cases. Social distancing put in place um, in the middle of March, initially advisory measures, uh, and then on the 20th of March, schools and restaurants, etc., were closed, um, and then a formal lockdown on the 23rd of March. Next slide, please. A clear need for um, kind of looking at how we could deal with this um, looking how we could deal with this surge, a uh, surge that we were, we were, you know, we were about to, uh, about to face. A need to, to cancel elective um, and outpatient activity, changing to sort of video consultations, etc. some of which Tim has talked about with regards to addiction settings, and a need to up, upscale emergency department, critical care and internal medicine uh, facilities. We, in my hospital, we reorganised the emergency floor, creating a specific respiratory majors area in the emergency department to deal with the, the COVID patients that we were seeing. We increased the internal medicine wards, wards that were previously surgical. Other wards were turned into internal medicine wards to admit COVID patients who didn't need critical care. We had a fourfold increase in critical care and ventilating ventilation capacity within my hospital and across the UK, probably about a doubling of critical care capacity, which was a, a significant challenge. And that has been sufficient to deal with the surge that we've seen um, as of today.
There's about a 20% vacancy across critical care in the UK. It wasn't only space issue, also there was significant redeployment of staff, so staff wing elective and ambulatory outpatient services uh, redeployed to the emergency care pathway and, and critical care. Um, recently retired, coming back to work within hospitals, recently qualified medical students um, working within hospitals, etc. And, and clear need for staff education of those that were being redeployed into areas that they weren't uh, normally working in, um, education regarding PPE and re regarding COVID itself. Um, a whole load of different areas where there was a need to upscale supply. PPE, I know we talked about in, in previous uh, webinars. Um, one of the challenges in the UK hasn't necessarily been supply, but changes in the guidelines and therefore staff uh, getting used to those changes and, and getting used to using the PPE appropriately. Oxygen has been an issue, not so much supply per se, but just the, the physical engineering and changing the supply within the hospital to areas that don't normally need large volumes of oxygen, to wards that don't normally use large volumes and, and new critical care areas that are using ventilation and non-invasive ventilation. And then drugs, both from a, an anaesthetic and a palliative care perspective. And, and I, I think that's another issue that's been a significant challenge is, is looking at kind of upscaling of palliative care management, both in the hospital setting and in the community setting. And one of the real challenges there has been with, with the restrictions in movement of uh, family members and family members not being able to visit people within hospital who are dying and not being able to communicate well with those uh, families has also been a significant challenge for staff and, and for families uh, losing their loved ones. Next slide, please. Um, the, the NHS has built a, a large number of field hospitals, um, kind of temporary hospitals, so-called Nightingale hospitals throughout the UK in exhibition centres, universities, sports data, etc. Uh, many thousands of potential beds including one in London that potentially could have 4,000 ventilated beds. Currently, there are 500 in that um, uh, in that centre, although thankfully at the moment they haven't had to be used. There's only tens of patients in these facilities because there is significant capacity within the NHS bed stock. Next slide, please. Just turning briefly to the epidemiology, um, as I mentioned, um, cases started to increase in the latter part of March. We've seen a stabilization in the last 10 days or so throughout the UK as a whole. Um, almost 100,000 cases now, the data on this slide is a day old. Uh, but this is probably an underrepresentation because almost all of the testing, which is the blue on this slide, is only hospitalized cases. There's almost no testing happening in the community. So we've really no idea of what the prevalence of this condition is in the community amongst asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic individuals. In terms of a hospital test results, Lewis mentioned earlier that that was also a challenge in the UK as well, particularly at the beginning of this um, issue when it was taking us a day, sometimes two days to get the results back. Within my hospital now, we get a result back within a few hours. So, you know, that, that's helpful in terms of uh, targeting patient management. Next slide, please. In terms of number of individuals in hospital beds, uh, about 20,000 currently across the UK um, in hospital beds with, uh, with, uh, with COVID. Plateauing of that in the last 10 days or so. Um, in my hospital, we've seen a significant plateau, in fact, a decline in the last three, four, five days. Um, but I think the next challenge is going to be patients stepping down from critical care and then the potential concerns over a second wave after uh, lockdown may be uh, relaxed. Um, we've had, on the bottom of the slide there, we've had one uh, particular patient within my hospital that's created uh, an awful lot of media and police um, presence within the hospital. The Prime Minister was discharged, thankfully, a few days ago, which has uh, made things an awful lot easier on all sorts of fronts. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of looking at deaths, I mean, clearly there have been horrible statistics from all around the world. Um, nearly 13,000 deaths in the UK thus far. Again, the data on this slide is a, is a day old. Uh, we are paralleling the, uh, the Italian uh, data set. Um, 
There's been some plateauing in the last three or four days, seven to 800 a day compared to 800 to 900 uh, a few days ago. But this is hospital deaths and is therefore likely a significant underrepresentation of the overall burden from a mortality perspective. The next slide shows uh, data from the Office of National Statistics, which compiles deaths for all causes throughout the UK. This, this, some of this data is lagging because it, that there is delays in the reporting of deaths, but we've seen a five to six thousand fold increase in the number of deaths per week expected over the over the seasonal norm. Um, but not all of those increases are accounted for by COVID deaths. Um, so uh, of those 5,000, probably three and a half to 4,000 of them are recorded as being COVID related. Whether that's an underrepresentation of COVID in, in community deaths, whether that's an issue with the data, or whether it's an increase in deaths from other causes at the moment, I think we don't really understand yet. Next slide, please. And kind of linked to that, Lewis also mentioned this in terms of the decrease in emergency department presentations for other causes. This is, this is data from throughout the UK looking at ED presentations, um, about a third decrease in all presentations, um, about a quarter decrease in emergency admissions to hospital, despite the increase in COVID presentations. And the, the two graphs on the right hand show, side show decrease in presentations related to myocardial ischemia and, and GI illness. And from a myocardial ischemia perspective, if you look at the national UK data, about a 50% decrease in PCI for acute myocardial ischemia. So, you know, the concern is, is there a, you know, an unmet burden of significant morbidity or mortality that's happening out in the community because of the focus on COVID potentially? Next slide, please. Um, I just want to finish briefly by talking a little bit about data collection and research. Um, because I think this is really important in the context of what is a new disease which you understand poorly. It's been clear to me that the more patients I see with COVID, the more I realize the complexity of the condition and the difficulty in predicting who is going to go on to deteriorate. And, you know, as Lewis said, it's, it's very different to so many other conditions that we see. We see, you know, patients with very low saturations who are relatively well, we see acute deterioration that's difficult to predict. I think some of that is probably inflammatory or microthrombotic. And so uh, needing to uh, get, getting data on the pattern of presentations, biomarkers, optimum management, et cetera, I think is, is really important. Um, it, it, this, this is one data set that's been collected in the UK through an intensive care network. Um, data so far on almost 4,000 ICU admissions with COVID-19. There's a I'm not going to go through the data in any detail. There's a report that's present on the web. If you just Google ICNARC, you can you can see the report. Detailed data on the demographics, on, on clinical parameters, on management and on outcome. Uh, next slide, please. This is another international network that I would encourage people to join. This is not just critical care admissions. This is all hospital admissions. Uh, it's currently um, collecting data in 240 sites in 25 countries around the world, data on just over 10,000 COVID patients. And there's a report available on the web for just over 3,000 cases up to the 25th of March that had 14 day follow up. Um, one important bit of data is that the, the data down on the on the right, um, bottom right here, which I think is an important message we need to get across to the public. So this is outcome data on about 1500 patients, 900 of whom were discharged and 500 of whom died. I think one of the issues for the public is they see on the news every day, tens of thousands of deaths around the world. You know, this is a terrible condition. And yes, it is a terrible condition. But there are a large number of individuals who have been discharged from hospital, as Lewis said, you know, patients discharged from the emergency department and, and even greater numbers been discharged from internal medicine and from critical care. So I think it's an important message for us to get across to the public. Finally, two minutes, if I may, just talking about clinical trials. Um, uh, that we've already heard about hydroxychloroquine and remdesivir from previous ACMT webinars. I just want to briefly mention two in the UK. Next slide, please. The, the uh, REMAP-CAP um, trial, which is an international ICU-based trial recruiting in 60 sites across 13 countries. 
This is a study that's been underway for a number of years, but is a, a, an adaptive study that, had, that was specifically designed to change in the context of a pandemic. Um, they currently recruited 173 patients, um, some to um, domains that were, that were already within the study, looking at macrolide therapy and steroid treatment, and some for new domains that have been specifically designed for COVID-19, including antivirals, hydroxychloroquine and IL-6, um, uh, IL-1 um, treatment modulators. Finally, uh, the recovery trial. The next slide, please. My final slide. Um, this is a, a large national UK trial of all hospital presenters with COVID-19, a pragmatic, large randomized control trial led by the University of Oxford. It's so far recruited just under 4,900 patients in 160 sites across the UK. Um, it, it's got kind of a, a relatively pragmatic, small data field outcome looking at uh, time to discharge or death, time to ventilation or renal replacement therapy, and we'll have health data linkage to look at secondary outcomes um, and morbidities. It's uh, got five study arms um, comparing standard care with the pinavir, ritonavir, steroid treatment, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin. Uh, so um, that, that's, that's my final slide. I just want to say thank you for, for the invitation to talk. It's, COVID is clearly a significant international challenge. There's been a Herculean effort by NHS and social care in the UK. I think on the whole, we cope well. I, I echo what Lewis has said about there being an excellent morale in the hospital, despite the challenges and the sea change in the way that everyone has been working. I think there's uncertainty over what the next few weeks and months are going to bring in terms of what happens when lockdown is, is, uh, is relaxed, what the impact on other conditions is of all of this. And, and alongside the acute management, I think it's really important that we're looking at collecting data on these patients so we can further understand this complex disease to predict risk and optimise care of these patients both for this current pandemic and, and unfortunately for the future when it's likely we may face similar issues. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, uh, Lewis, for your updates. Please remember that uh, this is recorded. Your questions have come in. If you want to have more questions that we don't get to uh, answer today, we will answer them in our upcoming Frequently uh, Asked Questions website or webpage. We already have an FAQ webpage up and running with um, the, uh, uh, the questions that we received from our first webinar. So please go to our website to look at these uh, answers. Um, I'm gonna try to go through several questions and we will probably have to stick around till 4.15 p.m. Eastern. If you have to disconnect, we understand, but if you can stick around for another 15 minutes, we can go through some questions from the audience. Um, I will go ahead and start by asking questions uh, uh, regarding our poison center uh, presentations. Um, this is for Diane and Dan. Uh, some questions that came in. One of them was, uh, you, can you comment on the demographics of people calling the call centers? Uh, the second question is, uh, can you comment on the uh, potential increase in exposures among children since they are staying at home, as well as substance use disorders uh, in, in, these, in these times of stress? So if you all want to address that, uh, Diane or Dan, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> this is Diane. I, I can't say that I know exactly the um, demographic data, although I will say that we um, have gotten a representative calls from you know the areas of the state that we get the most from and the areas that we get the least from it's kind of followed that same pattern so we have less populous counties in new jersey where we're hearing from fewer people um we are getting a <clears throat> quite a lot of both english and spanish volume um and across a broad range i think that the um it appears, it would make sense to me that we're hearing more about young children exposures at home. Um, and I look forward to kind of seeing that national data as it comes out. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what the pattern has been in New Jersey, but it certainly feels that way on the phone that we're getting a lot of 
calls about what happens when everybody's locked in the same house for you know a long period of time with with uh, kids and parents working from home. So I'm sorry, I don't have a more data-driven answer. Maybe Dan has a little more light to shed on that. Thank you. Yes, Dan, go ahead if you have anything to add. You should be unmuted, Dan. Can you please speak up? Yeah, sorry, we, we've taken a snapshot locally, and we haven't seen any significant changes in the trends of our calls. A lot of the information calls are obviously about adults seeking to use uh, products probably inappropriately, but no overall trends have, have become apparent to us. Very good, thank you. Now, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Diane real quick about credentialing of your volunteers. Was that difficult to get your volunteers into the system? I know in, in, in our state, in Georgia, uh, it, took, it took some time to get people uh, hired. Thanks for the question, Ziad. I think that's been uh, multi-pronged. Uh, you know, <clears throat> when we have, we have two kinds, of, we have three kinds of staffing currently kind of filling the need at the Poison Center. The first has been volunteer staffing. The majority of those have been within Rutgers and uh, Rutgers has been, um, you know, helping us to kind of fast track onboarding and, and bringing people who we kind of already know about into the system. External volunteers have come, for example, to the Office of Emergency Management. The, um, those people are actually staff who have been vetted through OEM. Um, and then we are uh, accelerating or hiring permanent staff. And, you know, the, all of these things do take time. And so it's required kind of a creative week by week, you know, who do we have that we can uh, put on the phones? and you know, kind of safely vet and and get them on the phones with adequate supervision. I need to give a shout out to Dr. Bruce Ruck, who um, is the managing director of the New Jersey Poison Center, has trained somebody new for the phones almost every day since we have come on, the, on board on the COVID scene. And that involves sitting with them personally and training them. I've also learned a lot from Dr. Brooks, and who has you know, a, a training session that he provides to all the students who come on board. So the effort of kind of recruiting, retaining and training volunteers has become a major part of our operation and is, uh, and, and is a significant challenge. Thank you. I'd like to turn uh, some questions to Dr. Nelson. Uh, if we can unmute him, please. Uh, Dr. Nelson, we have, I have several questions here that uh, hopefully you can help with. One of them is, uh, you know, typically uh, regarding the uh, clinical trials, are, are, is uh, your emergency department involved in actual clinical trials or is this being done in the inpatient side? The second question is related to um, your uh, protocol to discharge patients with a set of 90%. Can you elaborate on that a little bit and how you follow up on them? And finally, have you seen any particular uh, complications like thrombotic diseases uh, in these patients? Uh, which one thrombotic diseases? Are we saying? Yeah. yeah, those are all great questions, of course. Um, with the ED is not involved in any clinical trials, but the hospital is. And um, the, probably the most interesting thing we're doing is where we've done already eight transfusions with convalescent uh, uh, plasma for several patients. Now, obviously, that's very experimental and we don't have a control group. And in fact, it's it's a little bit complicated because we don't even know, there's no way to even measure titers of the antibody in the convalescent plasma. We're just using uh, plasma we're getting from the blood bank in people who have had COVID. And as you saw the New England Journal piece a couple of maybe a week or two ago, um, we're really comparing it to what we believe a historical control would look like. Um, there, are some, there are some trials looking at some of the IL-6 inhibitors and um, also, there was one we were starting to look a little bit at hydroxychloroquine, but I think that that is sort of being done by so many people, it's not really of any value anymore. But the ED specifically is a place where some people get started on these medications, but we're not actively involved in the clinical trials per se. Um, our protocol for discharging patients at 90% uh, is as simple as it sounds. Uh, you know, if you 
if you're at rest 92, if you're at rest 93 or greater, so 92 or below, um, and you can walk and keep your set above 90%, um, most of us are comfortable as needs be sending you home with good follow-up um, done by either telehealth or by a phone call from one of the hospital services that are doing the that are doing the follow-ups. Now those people are all tested um, if uh, if we can, and the follow-ups are provided to the patients when they uh, are contacted. Uh, we'd like more frequent contact. Initially, the contact was day one, seven, and fourteen, and now it's daily contact in order to make sure that they're not deteriorating. And there's always an invite to come back as soon as you get sick. To the best of our knowledge, and again, this has been overwhelming. We're saying, you know, we're doing several hundred follow-ups every day at this point, so it's hard to keep straight exactly all the data. Uh, the process has worked fairly well. We have had people come back, not unpredictably, um, and even some of those people have gotten intubated and admitted, admitted, and some of them have been intubated, but the process does seem to work. Um, you know, desperate times call for desperate measures. There's no way we could admit those people to the hospital. Um, and the thrombotic question is absolutely, it's been one of the really shocking parts of the disease, I think, for many. We've had three people with massive PEs who should not by any means have had PEs. They've all gotten thrombolytics. Uh, one of them has died, one has recovered actually very nicely, and one of them is still uh, suffering um, with, uh, with disease. So it's unclear what their outcome is going to be. But some have suggested perhaps, and Paul even mentioned this, Dargan, that some of these pulmonary complications might actually be microthrombotic in nature. And now we're finding more renal issues and others. Uh, so it may turn out to be a big, a big part of, of the disease. In fact, the D-dimers on almost every patient that we have seen have been markedly elevated. Thank you, that's great. Um, I'll actually keep you unmuted and uh, maybe unmute Dr. Dark and I have a question here that maybe both of you can comment on. It's regarding the uh, uh, difference in antibody in, uh, in uh, testing for COVID-19 that, uh, that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Nelson. Uh, Dr. Dargan, you have uh, more rapid testing. Can you maybe comment on, uh, let's start with Dr. Dargan, how that helps in your disposition, how that uh, makes a difference? And then Dr. Nelson, how that uh, is a problem. And finally, from Tehran, one of our colleagues uh, wanted to share with us, because of their delay in their uh, testing as well, what they do in Tehran is they are getting CT scans of the chest to kind of like, uh, you know, add to their diagnostic uh, assessment of these patients while testing is, uh, is being uh, processed. So Dr. Duncan, maybe you can comment on the value of rapid testing that you have. Yeah, so, so I mean, I, I think it's actually not necessarily helpful from a directly clinical or management perspective, because it, I mean, essentially it's a clinical diagnosis. You know, you can kind of spot these patients from the end of the bed, as it were. You know, they're acutely respiratory compromised and yet are, are relatively well and they have significantly abnormal x-rays. And I, I echo the, the value of radiography in these patients. I think the value of the early test is with regard cohorting of patients on the wards and the use of PPE in, in patients. So the way that we're, we're running our internal medicine floors is that patients who are suspected COVID are managed as though they have COVID. Patients that have definitive COVID are managed on in open bays. And that, that may be patients of four or six patients within a bay. And so staff can use PPE as they go into that bay patients that are COVID negative are managed on COVID negative wards with definitive PPE in those areas to try and, you know, maintain infection control. So I think the gr its greatest value is from an infection control perspective rather than necessarily from a direct clinical management perspective. Dr. Nelson, do you uh, have anything else to add or do you, do you agree? Uh, I, I mean, I agree to some very large extent, of course. You know, what's fascinating about the radiography question is that we've had people come in. I mean, literally people come in, they get hit by a car and we get a chest x-ray on them as routine care and they have COVID in their lungs. I mean, the, the, the extent of this disease is scary for people who are fairly asymptomatic and people have come in with ostensibly what looks like renal colic and we get a CT scan 
looking for a stone and they have, you know, they have COVID on, on, you know, visible in their lung fields. We've not been doing a lot of SCTs because of the complication of having to decontaminate and you know, all of the logistics around getting that done. But we, we've been doing a lot of chest x-rays and it's clearly impressive. We don't know what we're missing, of course. The testing issue has been complicated too because I think the sensitivity of the test, the false negative rate is very high. And I think, as Paul Dargan alluded to, um, cohorting people is interesting. So we do cohort positives. My concern about cohorting negatives is that we've seen what I believe are a lot of people who've had negative tests clearly have a look like COVID, including the chief secretary to go with it. And I think the problem we're running into with testing in the US, and again, I don't know what's going on in Europe, honestly, is that the sample collection technique is so difficult. And I've watched people try to collect nasopharyngeal samples and basically just rub the inside of the nose and not really get the sample you need. So although the test itself might have a great sensitivity and specificity, I think the, data, the collection technique is so limited that it's causing problems in the sensitivity of the test. So um, I'm a little concerned about some of that, but there's a lot of value in a test. I mean, certainly from a, you know, a, an epidemiologic perspective, it's very important to know who's positive and who's negative and try to understand you know, what, is the, what is the fatality rate, what is, you know, what is the, the risk of, contagion, but peace of mind is very important too for providers and for patients as well, knowing that they are positive or negative. And if the test was that good, if it really had the reliability that we needed it to have, I think it would be wonderful. But given all the problems that we have with its ability to be relied on, um, I'm, I'm a little bit less uh, sanguine about it, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I would... Uh everything Lewis has said there with regards to the false negative rate and from a clinical perspective you know within my hospital and in terms of my own practice if the patient looks like they've got COVID and radio has radiographic changes consistent with COVID even if they've got a negative test that we manage as though they've got COVID mm -hmm. uh, and very often the next test on the next day will then be positive. <laughs> Thank you both I have four more questions that I'll try to run through quickly so uh, and then we can I promise I'll, uh, I'll uh, we'll get the rest of the questions uh, later on in the FAQ. So, uh, first quick question to Dr. Nelson. This came through just now when you were talking about thrombotic events. Do you recommend discharging the ones that are going home on aspirin? Uh, and then the second question to you, Dr. Nelson, is uh, to, can you comment on the volume? You know, so some other states are still bracing for a peak and their volumes are down now and they're worried about what their volume is going to look like in two weeks. Mm -hmm. You described that the volumes are still 60% of your usual volume despite the COVID uh, pandemic. Can you maybe uh, comment on that? And, uh, you know, did you did you modify your staffing or uh, during that period? So the answer to the discharge and aspirin question is no, although it's not a bad idea. Um, I'm not sure the true value of doing that. But anybody that's admitted now is getting started on an oxaparin, you know, low molecular heparin, and we're looking at looking, we're looking to go to oral apixaban uh, to replace that. The problem is obviously it's hard to give an intubated person oral medication, although obviously you can put it at an NG tube or something. But we are taking that risk very seriously, and and that's another good research project for Paul and his group to be, to be doing out in out in England and probably people on this call. The volume question is hard. You know, I, I'm on a bunch of listservs like most people are, and obviously as the chair of a department, this is something that very much concerns me. Um, we have no idea what's gonna happen. You know, I, I do think that the general belief um, is that the, the patients who haven't been coming in with quote unquote conventional problems, you know, people are still having strokes and MIs and everything else. We'll probably see a surge come of very sick people who've delayed care. But I think the concerns about viewing the emergency department as a place of contagion and as a place to avoid uh, may may ring true for a lot of places and it may take a very long time for volume to get back up as you know the airlines are suffering and, and malls are suffering and other places too because how do you get people back in it's completely unknown the, the one thing i didn't say that's even more fascinating than the volume in the, in the main ed is that our pediatric volume has almost fall, fell to nothing I mean, I think we're, at one day we saw five patients in our pediatric ED. And and obviously, uh, you know, with all due respect to the PZDs, they do tend to see patients with lower acuity, but it's not like these children have a lot of other options to go get care. 
pediatricians offices are closed, clinics are closed. So I'm concerned that some of these might have blossomed into more concerning problems. And I do hope the pediatric volume comes back as well. So it's really unknown completely what this place is, the world's going to look like in six months or, or a year. And I think that everybody's getting as good as mine, but it's a concern we all have. Many, many, well, I'm in a public hospital, so I feel relatively safe. Um, but many of the private hospitals are losing money. They're hemorrhaging money, honestly. And some of the contract groups we see in emergency medicine are, are literally ready to file for bankruptcy because they can't afford to pay their staff. So it's very unclear what's going to happen. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dargan, do you want to comment a little bit on the change in the uh, public uh, response in the UK from the initial approach of, uh, you know, writing this out with uh, herd immunity? Uh, social distancing. Would you like to comment on that? And I also an update on the antibody testing that's being worked on for the public. Yeah, so so maybe starting with the antibody testing. But my understanding of that, I'm not I'm not going to directly involved with it. But my understanding with that at the moment is that there are there are issues from a, a laboratory and, and quality control perspective, and uh, it's still some way off in terms of us having a a, a workable antibody test. But I think that is going to be really important. And one of the things that I alluded to earlier is that one of the problems in the UK is that essentially all of the testing is happening within hospitals or, you know, 95% of the testing is happening within hospitals. So we have no idea really of what the, the overall disease burden is at a, at a community level uh, from a, an asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic perspective. And, you know, Lewis mentioned the issue of patients coming in with other conditions and you you know, you do a chest x-ray or CT and you, you, you find that they've got horrible looking radiology. So I think there is a significant burden out there in the community uh, of COVID that we're, we're not aware of. And clearly that's going to be important in terms of uh, post lockdown, in terms of looking at, uh, you know, uh, changes to the social distancing uh, measures. Um, in terms of the UK's approach, um, I think we were all quite surprised that potentially that you know it, it took it took a while for those changes to be uh, to be put in place so uh, but there's it's been clear that there has been a significant impact of the the social distancing measures you know we've seen it as i showed from the from the data i presented significant leveling off in in numbers of cases significant leveling off of hospital presentations and of uh, and of severe cases so there's no doubt there's been a significant impact. I can't really comment on why the politicians uh, took the decisions that they that they took, but um, once the measures were put in place, there's been a significant impact, certainly. Okay, thank you. Last question to uh, Dr. Kalilo or Dr. Brooks. Triaging patients over the phone or talking to patients over the phone, do you have to triage them into a hospital if you're suspecting uh, COVID-19? How do you do that? Do you have a protocol for that? This question came to us from Iraq, actually. Just to remind everybody, this is a really an international effort with international organizations as well as US-based organizations. So uh, it's really great to have the participation from all around the world and something that we really, really cherish uh, when we organize these webinars. So, um, that's my last question to uh, Diane or, or Dan. Well, in Arizona, we've um, been working closely with our public health folks, the county and state folks, and we've been using the 85% rule, which is, uh, you know, based on the data we have now, which is carrying forward in time, about 85% of folks will be able to stay at home and, and not have to seek professional health care where they could either get other folks sick or actually get exposed and get sick. So, you know, we look at risk factors, obviously their age and comorbidities, but our uh, experience to date is that we're keeping as many people as home as we can. Are you add something? You're unmuted. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I mean, there is a bit of a gestalt on the phone, which is why we're careful to maintain quality control in the line. And, um, you know, anybody who's reporting that they're really having trouble breathing or appears to have a significant cough on the line, you know, we're trying to encourage to seek medical care. But uh, <clears throat> the overwhelming number of patients that are calling um, are encouraged to stay home if they have mild sounding symptoms, but it is hard to implement clinical guidelines when all you really have is the report you're getting over the phone. I think it's also an interesting nuance as we move to this telemedicine, um, you know, 
revolution. There's certain things you can tell by talking and there's certain things that, that you just have to make the jump and say, go in versus stay home. So it's yeah, just a good decision. Absolutely, but still a valuable service. You know, we at, in Georgia, we also offer the opportunity for callers to sign up for a callback system so we can call them back about changes in messaging or recommendations. That's great. Excellent. So I want to really thank all our participants and thank you for being patient with us. Uh, it's 4.20 p.m. Uh, sorry for keeping you uh, late. Uh, make sure you tune into our website to look at our previous recordings, this recording, the PDF of the slides. Don't forget about the FAQs. We usually announce our next topic uh, on Monday morning because we're going to bring you the, the, the latest and the greatest. So we really wait to the last minute to, uh, to, uh, to update our program and finalize it. Uh, we will see you on uh, April 22nd at 3 p.m. Eastern. Remember our webinar this Friday on addiction medicine, as well as uh, our frequent uh, social media communication. Please uh, follow us and uh, tweet us any questions. You can also email us any questions using our website information. Thank you, everyone, and have a great afternoon.